This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Jesus said, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Luke 12, 15. Dear friend, I want you to appreciate with me that the Bible talks a lot about money. The Bible talks about greediness. It talks about a man's responsibility to give back to God. And it talks about the fact that some otherwise faithful children of God will lose their souls because they love money. With these things in mind, we're going to do a study today from the book of Malachi about money. Now, someone speaks up and says, why Malachi? We don't live under the Old Testament today. We live under the New Testament. And that's absolutely right. But what we're going to do is we're going to notice some principles from the Old Testament that are still true today. You know, Romans 15, 4 says that the things that were written aforetime, that is talking about the Old Testament, they were written for our learning. And so we're going to learn some things about the heart of man from the Old Testament, but we're going to take our instructions for giving from the New Testament. Now, here's the first point that I want you to appreciate with me in this study. Number one, it is possible for a man to rob God. Let that sink in a minute. It is possible for a man to rob God. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8, the Lord asked a very strong and pointed question there. Will a man rob God? Now, you might think, surely not. Surely not and expect to get away with it. You know, a man might rob another man. A man might rob a bank. A man might rob the helpless and defenseless. But who in his right mind would rob God? Listen to verse 8 of the text. He says, but you have robbed me. Now, friends, to whom is this said? This is not said to people in the world, although they rob him every day. This is said to God's own children, according to verse number 4. God's own people were robbing him. And do you know what they said when it was pointed out? Verse number 8, they said, In what way have we robbed you? What are you talking about? Lord, we haven't robbed you. You know, it's easy for us to overlook our own sins, isn't it? You know, we see other people's sins, but we don't like to see our own. When I first began preaching years ago, I remember I preached a sermon one week on a sin that didn't really apply to any of our members, and I got a lot of amens. The next week, I preached on a sin that was applicable to many of our members, and I got no amens. And so the third week, I preached a sermon entitled, Amen, That's Not My Sin. You know, it's easy to overlook our own sins, isn't it? There's a story told about a settlement in the Old West where people were engaged in the lumbering business. Well, they decided they wanted a church, and so they built a building, and they hired a preacher, and the new preacher came in, and in the beginning he was very well received, until one day he was out and he saw some members collecting logs that had been floating down the river. You see, each log was marked with the owner's stamp on the end. Well, as he watched, he saw the members pulling the logs in. They would saw off the end where the owner's stamp appeared. And so the next Sunday, the preacher preached a sermon on the text, Thou shalt not steal. And the members congratulated him on his wonderful message. Well, he went out the next week, and he saw them once again continuing to steal logs. And so the next Sunday, he preached on the topic, Thou shalt not cut the end off of thy neighbor's logs. Well, when he got through with this one, the congregation ran him out of town. Now, what's the point? Friends, the point is the hardest person to put under the correction of God's Word is myself. All through the book of Malachi, the people are going to do this. They will not accept the blame. They shift blame. In chapter 1 and verse 6, The priest have despised my name, says the Lord. Here's their response. In what way have we despised your name? Chapter 1 and verse 7, the Lord said, You've offered defiled bread upon my altar. They said, 
In what way have we defiled you? Chapter 2 and verse 17, he says, You have wearied the Lord with your words, saying that evil is good. They said, In what way have we wearied him? Chapter 3 and verse 7, You've gone away from the truth and need to return. In what way shall we return? Give us an example is what they're saying. No such thing has happened. We don't know what you're talking about. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing how good we are at being oblivious to our own situation. Oh, you point out my shortcomings and you watch out. What does it mean to rob God? It doesn't mean to take from Him. God is so mighty that we couldn't possibly do that if we wanted to. What it means is to withhold from God that which we should be giving, giving Him. And friends, oftentimes that happens. You know, we're very generous with friends and we're very generous with family, but we're very stingy with the Lord. And when we do that, we are robbing God. And here's why this is so important. No man can do that and go to heaven. So our first point in the lesson is that it is possible for a man to rob God. Here's point number two. It is possible for a man to rob God financially. Now, listen to verse 8 of Malachi chapter 3. It mentions the fact that they had robbed him, quote, in tithes and offerings. That is to say, you have robbed me financially. Now, tithing was an Old Testament commandment. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22 says, You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. Now, to tithe meant to give 10%. Today, in the New Testament era, the Lord has not bound tithing. This is what the New Testament says. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1 says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. We learn that in the New Testament, a Christian is to give on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. He is to give in a cheerful manner, 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7. And he is to give as God has prospered him. But friends, many people do not do this. Many people rob God when it comes to their giving. Now, some people, they give nothing at all. In fact, you might be surprised at the number of people who come to worship and they sing and they pray and they listen to preaching and they partake of the Lord's Supper and then they give nothing. You know, a Christian might as well leave off any other act as to omit giving. Now, there are other people who give just a small portion of what they ought to be giving. Now, that was Israel's problem. In our text, verses 9 and 10, the Lord said, You are cursed with a curse. Now, here's the reason. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. You see, the problem wasn't that they weren't giving at all. They were giving. The problem is they weren't giving as much as they should have been giving. And the Lord says, they were robbing me. He says, they were keeping back a portion of it for themselves. Now, I don't know what the amount was. Maybe they should have been giving 10%, but they were giving 5%. Friends, a very similar thing happens today. You know, you heard the story about the family who was on their way home from worship services, and the, the woman says, boy, the song leading sure was terrible today. And her husband says, yeah, and the preaching was some of the worst I've ever heard. And their little boy pipes up in the back seat and says, I thought it was a pretty good service for a dollar. <laughs> you know, that might be funny if there weren't so much truth in it. Some people got into the habit of giving a dollar when they were young, maybe when they were kids. And now they're worth 10 times as much, 20 times as much as they were then, but they're still giving a dollar or, or a very small amount. But you know, God's religion is not a cheap religion. The religion of the Lord costs all that you have. And friend, if you find that Christianity is a small part of your life and it costs you very little, no doubt you're robbing God. And it's a very serious thing because a person will go to hell if he continues in that situation. Well, then we have a third category. We have those who give God the leftovers. 
That is, they give God what they don't need. They give God what they don't want. They give God what they have left over after they've paid for all of the nice things that they want in life. Dear friend, God does not want our leftovers. And if that's what you're giving Him, you're robbing God. You know, one man said, I can tell what kind of a Christian a man is by looking at his checkbook. And you know, that is largely true. Now somebody says, you're not going to reduce faithful giving or faithful living to my giving, are you? I would never do that. But I do know that a man who will rob God financially is a man who doesn't have his priorities right. Now, how are we to give? Well, we're to give as we have been prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. But somebody says, but what is the amount? In the New Testament, God has not specified a percentage. But I can look at principles. Now, I can learn something from the Old Testament. I learned that in the Old Testament, He specified 10%. Now, that kind of helps me have some sort of an idea of where to begin. I also know that in the first century, Christians were selling their land and they were selling their possessions and they were giving it. I know that in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3, Paul holds up the Macedonian Christians as an example and he compliments them strongly because he says that they gave as they were able and even beyond their ability. And then in verse 2, he mentions that they were very financially poor. I want you to think about that. They were poor, but they were giving beyond their ability. But friends, today, especially in the United States of America, we're very rich. Now, you might be thinking, I'm not rich. That doesn't apply to me. I want you to listen to this. There's a very interesting website located at globalrichlist.com. Globalrichlist.com. If you will go to that site and you will put in your annual income, it will tell you how rich or poor you are as compared to the rest of the world. And so I went to this website and I, I put in several different entries. For example, if you make $15,000 a year, it says that you are in the top 8% richest in the world. If you make $30,000 a year, you are in the top 1.23% richest in the world. If you make over 50,000 a year, you are in the top 1% of the richest people in the world. And listen to this. If you make $10,000 per year in the United States, in this country, you are considered below the poverty level. But if you look at this worldwide, according to this site, you are in the top 16% of the richest people in the world. Now, what's the point I'm making? Friends, the point I'm making is, in the United States, we are considered very wealthy people. But you know, the problem is, a lot of Christians don't give as if they are wealthy people. There are Christians who own a house and a car, maybe two cars. They make $50,000 a year, but they give $10 a week to the Lord. That would mean that they are giving 1% of their income to God. This is exactly the sort of thing that Israel was doing. Friends, do you know what the basic fundamental difference is in a faithful steward and an unfaithful steward? It can be summarized in this statement. A faithful giver will always adjust his living to his giving, whereas the unfaithful giver will always adjust his giving to his living. And so let's suppose a man's income is, well, you set the figure. Whether it be $1,000 a week or $10,000 a week or, or $10 a week, the amount is unimportant. But whenever that amount comes into his possession, how is he going to make distribution of it? Is he going to say so much for the house payment and so much for the utility bill and so much for the insurance and, and oh yes, I need to set something aside for the plate on the Lord's day. Friends, if he does that, if, if the Lord's giving, the offering to God is an afterthought, he's not doing it right. I want you to take a little test with me. I want you to ask yourself, what is my income? Now I want you to ask yourself, what is my weekly contribution to the Lord's cause? And then ask, what percentage am I actually returning to God? Now when you figure this out, I want you to go back and look at the command and ask yourself, have I been robbing God? And so point number one is that a man can rob God. 
Point number two, a man can rob God financially. Point number three is that giving is an act of worship. In Malachi chapter 1 and verse 8, the Lord discusses the sacrifices that His people were giving Him in worship. Listen to the text. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably, says the Lord of hosts. Now, what's going on here? You see, when it came time for worship, what the people were doing is they would go out and find some lamb that had been mauled the previous night by a ravenous beast, and they would rush it to the priest, and they would say, Give this to God. And what God is saying to them is, Try offering that to your governor. He wouldn't take that. You see, the point is they were not offering God the best they had. What they were saying to God is, in essence, this is what we think you are worth. And friends, he was disgusted by it. If you will do a search in your Bible software, you'll find the phrase sweet aroma appears 43 times in the New King James Bible. 41 of those times are in the Old Testament, and they have reference to making animal sacrifices to God as worship. It appears twice in the New Testament. Once it is a reference to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, Ephesians 5 and verse 2, and the only other time is with reference to our giving in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 18. Now follow me on this. Giving is commanded, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Giving is done at the same time as the other acts of worship. Giving requires the preparation of our hearts, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7. And giving is a sacrifice and a sweet aroma to God. Now here's what I'm getting at. Friends, giving has all of the marks of worship. Friends, when I don't give as I have prospered, when, when I short God financially, that's my worship to Him. I'm saying, Lord, here's all that I'm willing to give you. This is all that you're going to get for me. This is what I think you are worth. Okay, point number one, a man may rob God. Point two, he may rob God financially. Point number three, giving is an act of worship. Now here is point number four. How we give is a reflection of our spirituality. Malachi chapter 1 and verse 13. You also say, oh, what a weariness. And you sneer at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Thus you bring an offering. Should I accept this from your hand, says the Lord. Now friends, let's tie all of this together. Behold what a weariness it is. That's what they're saying. The people were having the attitude that this is a nuisance to us. We are put out that we have to do this. We don't want to do this. It cost us too much. What were they saying? I want you to notice the immediate next statement. He says, you bring the stolen, the lame, and the sick. Dear friend, their pathetic offering was a reflection of their attitude. What a weariness it is. Here's the point we're making. How we give is a reflection of our spirituality. Now, sometimes folks get offended when you say that, and, and they say, wait a minute, you're not saying that Christianity is determined by how I give, are you? But really, we are saying that because it is. My giving reflects my feelings and my faith toward God. You know, oftentimes we talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 that a man is to give as he's purposed in his heart. So let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And we talk about the fact that we need to be giving because we want to. If I'm giving because I have to, that says something about my spirituality. You know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 2, Paul speaks about some of the early Christians in Macedonia, and he says that in their deep poverty, they abounded in the riches of their liberality. Now, that, that means they were very poor, but they were giving very generously. I want you to listen to verse 3. He says, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Now, friends, Paul uses this as a great compliment to their spirituality. Their giving was a compliment and a reflection of their spirituality. 
But listen to this. When you get down to verse number 8, Paul tells the Corinthians, he says, I'm using this to test the sincerity of your love. He was saying that how they gave was a measure of their spirituality. The sacrifices they made would be proof of their sincerity as followers of Jesus Christ. And friends, the same thing is true for us today. Friends, it is a true statement that you can tell a lot about a man's faith by looking at his checkbook. You know, you can look at a man's checkbook and tell if he loves souls or if he doesn't. You can tell if he is grateful for what God has done for him or if he's not. You can tell if a man believes he will be judged for his giving or if he doesn't believe that. You can tell if he's laying up treasures in heaven and you can tell if he's not. You know, when God brought the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt and they began to build the tabernacle, the Bible says in Exodus chapter 36 that the people brought free will offerings every morning. And it got to the point that they had far more than they actually needed. And Moses actually had to issue a command that they stop. And Exodus chapter 36 and verse 7 says this, So the people were restrained from, from bringing, for the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it and too much. Friends, wouldn't it be great if that could be said today? The people had to be stopped because we had enough. In fact, we have too much. Okay, point number five is that I can lose my soul because of my giving. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 8 says that God's people had robbed him with regard to their financial offerings. Now listen to verse 9. He says, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. Now, tie to that Malachi chapter 1 and verse 14. But cursed be the deceiver who has in his flock a male and takes a vow, but sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Friends, what does this verse mean? To whom is this curse pronounced? The curse is on the one who could do better. He had a male in his flock, but he chooses not to sacrifice it. Instead, he sacrificed a corrupt thing. Friends, we could do the same thing today. When we're in a situation when we could give more and do better, but we simply choose not to because I'd prefer to keep that money for myself, for eating out, or to drive a nicer car, or to have a fancier house. Maybe you're listening to this lesson and you determine about yourself, I really haven't been giving to the Lord as I should. You know, Paul holds Christ up as an example for us. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. Maybe you say, I haven't been giving as I ought to. If you recognize that, then you may need to make some changes. And you see, it won't fix itself. You may need to sit down and rework your budget. You may need to sit down and adjust your recreation. You may just have to commit that I'm going to do better. But you see, you have to do something because it won't fix itself. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, which some have strayed from the faith. Now, what's he mean by that? He's talking about people who are Christians. They have left faithful service to God because of their love for money. Keep going. In their greediness, and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Dear friend, may that never be said about us.